uh, in itself and uh, also it must be of certain magnitude okay that means uh, it must be it must talk mostly about um, uh, what do you say characters like uh, you know kings or queens the incidents uh, people of people belonging to a certain upper class and so on so that magnitude factor is also something uh, that is very important as far as the plot uh, is concerned uh, then of course comes the next one is the character and uh, uh, here this uh, particular term also comes uh, hamarsha okay a character uh, especially the main character the protagonist is somebody who has this kind of a flaw within himself so the character the, it refers to the personality or the part of an actor who represents that particular emotions in a play uh, but the main character especially with regard to tragedy uh, you know it the concept of hamarsha or tragic flaw comes into the picture where uh, you know he will have certain um, uh, what do you say certain aspects related to his uh, personality which may lead to his uh, downfall so uh, most of the characters in tragedies have that and uh, aristotle is uh, emphasizing upon that uh, then you have the thought okay what the characters think during the course of action in the play or it can also relate to the main idea uh, that is expressed through the play and uh, sometimes they may talk about the, their thoughts aloud okay so that the audience knows uh, what happens uh, then of course you have the language uh, you know the the diction the choice of language uh, which the playwright makes and the um, what do you say the characters they deliver their dialogues based on that particular language or aspects of language the diction uh, chosen by the playwright the, the writer okay so uh, diction and language is uh, something very important the expression of the meaning in words and uh, according to aristotle this should be proper and it should be uh, appropriate to the plot to the characters uh, and so on so uh, you know, as I said earlier, uh, much of the uh, dialogues, almost all the dialogues you can say are in poetic form. Uh, and that's why he also gives a lot of importance to poetry. Uh, then you have the music. Music can also mean the rhythm. Okay, so it is the fifth element that he talks about, the musical element. Uh, also, you have, we will look at that, uh, this uh, something known as the chorus, okay. Uh, chorus can be, uh, can refer to one person or it can be uh, more than one, it varies. And uh, generally, they, they talk about the uh, play, the characters, the events, sometimes mostly they, they come um, in the early part, okay and they provide a certain kind of introduction, a kind of a background to the plot and so on. And uh, this can also be in the form of a song. So he feels, Aristotle argues that their uh, rhythm and music must be integrated into the uh, play, into the proper play. And uh, as a result, I mean, he, what he means to say is that the chorus should not be external to the plot. Okay, the chorus should also be an integral part and uh, contribute to the unity of the plot as such. And then he also talks about the last one is uh, spectacle, the production of spectacular effects. Okay, and he says that depends on the art of what happens on stage. So people he feels may be emotionally attracted to the uh, spectacle, but he feels that uh, superior poets uh, you know, need not uh, rely on the spectacle part to arouse the uh, specific emotions, okay? They can uh, very well do it 
through the structure of the play, through their use of words, uh, language, and so on. So spectacle, you know, the visual elements, the, it can mean many things. It can mean the scenery or costumes uh, and other kinds of uh, you know, special effects that they may use. But you must understand it is nothing like what you may see in uh, movies today. Uh, the, these are the six elements. As I said, the term hamarsha is important. And there is also this particular term called as catharsis or cleansing. Uh, Aristotle's argument was that these six elements must lead to this kind of uh, cleansing of the uh, emotions of pity and fear. That means that is what it must evoke in um, in you as a member of the audience, as a viewer, as you watch the play. This is, uh, you know, what should happen, purging. Okay, it should, uh, the watching the play, the tragedy should arouse the emotions of pity and fear in order to purge away their excesses. And these passions he feels should be reduced or should be, should be maintained in a certain kind of uh, balanced proportion. So th these are the six elements that he talks about. Uh, you also have another thing which he gives a lot of uh, importance to, the three unities, the unities of time, place, and action. So this, you know, is something that he lays a lot of emphasis upon. Um, so the unity of time limits the action to the duration of, say, one day. That, that's what, you know, this is Aristotle's thing uh, of a day. And uh, unity of place to one, uh, you know, general uh, area or region uh, location. And uh, unity of action uh, to a single set of incidents, okay, uh, like a chain, they are all related to each other. One uh, particular uh, incident or, you know, action, it uh, functions as the cause and the rest of it is the effect or consequence of that uh, one particular, you know, uh, incident or event. Uh, so, you know, he, uh, he talks about this, but he doesn't, um, uh, what do you say, impose that they should be followed. But, he, you know, the, his argument is that if, the, uh, if these uh, unities are observed, uh, that would make an ideal play. But then it's not always, uh, uh, what do you say, I mean, how much of uh, an action can you show if everything is uh, limited? Okay, uh, just uh, one incident or a set of incidents or everything happening in one particular region and uh, the whole action should be, uh, you know, roughly the length of one day. Um, many playwrights don't follow these things, but, uh, you know, three unities are what um, Aristotle emphasized upon, uh, you know, with regard to some of the guidelines that he lays for uh, playwrights to follow in uh, poetics. Uh, now, coming to the first uh, play that uh, is mentioned in your syllabus, you have this Sophocles, okay, who was born in Athens, Greece, and he was born during this time, 495 BC to 406 uh, BC. And uh, he was one of the greatest of the Greek uh, dramatists. Okay, there were other two, Isitris and Euripides being the other two. Uh, and um, his, uh, you know, uh, Aristotle came much later. Okay? Aristotle came uh, probably half a century after uh, Sophocles. But um, Aristotle's theories of tragedies and, you know, the um, uh, various uh, aspects that he talks about uh, drama in poetics, uh, they're all pretty much based on Sophocles' uh, plays, especially the one that, you know, we have taken, Oedipus Rex or Oedipus the King. It is considered to be, you know, his uh, most important work. And um, Aristotle's theories are largely based on uh, how Sophocles 
uh, you know, has um, designed things in this play as well as in some of his uh, other works. Now, this, uh, this play uh, talks about, yeah, Oedipus is the uh, central character. Oedipus Rex Rex means the king. Oedipus, the king, is the main character. And uh, basically, uh, you know, it is, it talks about uh, Oedipus and uh, a kind of, you know, a predicament that uh, he uh, finds himself in, okay, based on so many factors. Uh, which he doesn't know, but, uh, you know, the author, I mean, the audience uh, gets to know about uh, all these things. And uh, <clears throat> we find that, uh, you know, okay, if you, again, if you look at some of the main characters, one is um, uh, Oedipus himself, and uh, he is married to Jocasta, okay, and uh, he is the king of Thebes. And the play begins, uh, you know, when uh, Oedipus finds out that uh, Thebes is in, you know, is going through this great famine plague. Uh, and the reason for that is that there is a person uh, who has murdered the previous king, King Elias. Uh, and, uh, you know, if they can find the murderer, the killer of Thebes and uh, banish that person from the kingdom, uh, the plague will be lifted. And because of the plague, people are really uh, struggling. Uh, and then, you know, uh, Oedipus sets out to investigate this, okay, like what has really happened to the former king Elias, and he finds that the former king was killed by a band of robbers. Uh, but then, you know, they want to find, uh, you know, these people who have killed them so that they, they can be banished. Uh, and the whole play is about that, as Oedipus sets out to find uh, who the killer is. And then towards the end, he finds out that the king, uh, the previous king, Lais, was none other than Oedipus' own father. Okay, because there was a kind of a prophecy when Oedipus was born. Uh, there was this prophecy that Oedipus would one day kill his father and marry his mother. And, you know, as a result of that, his parents, they abandoned him. Uh, but it's, it so happens where the person uh, who was supposed to ensure that uh, Oedipus doesn't live, does not kill the baby, but rather... He grows up and uh, Oedipus finds out that it was none other than he himself who has killed his own father, Laius, and marries Jocasta. Jocasta happens to be Oedipus' own uh, mother. Okay, so th this is the, uh, what do you say, uh, this is what the play is all about. Uh, and um, there are several things about Oedipus that we have to you know, say, but maybe we'll do that a little later. Uh, Jocasta is the queen of Thebes, and she was married to Laius. Uh, but as I said, you know, they they knew that one day her son would be the killer of her husband. So you know, they decide to get rid of the baby. But it does not really happen. And she, you know, as Oedipus, um, you know, questions people. Uh, talks to the oracles and uh, talks to people who have prophesied. Um, Jocasta is the first person who really realizes uh, that Oedipus, in fact, is the killer, uh, you know, of his own father. She, even before Oedipus uh, understands that, Jocasta uh, realizes it and she kills herself. Uh, then, of course, I mean, uh, there are many characters, just few characters we will look at in the time given. Uh, you have Creon. Creon happens to be Jocasta's uh, <clears throat> brother. Okay. And uh, it is he who brings this news from, uh, you know, the, he is a follower of uh, 
the Greek god Apollo, and he returns from Apollo's temple with this, uh, you know, the news from the priest, the oracle that uh, if Laius killer is not found, then the the whole kingdom would suffer. Uh, he is a he is a very loyal friend to uh, Oedipus, and uh, later on, you know, they fall out both of them. Uh, but then, you know, uh, because as Oedipus uh, is slowly uh, kind of investigating this matter, you know, uh, there is a particular uh, prophet, the prophet by the name Tiresias, who who knows uh, all about Oedipus. And uh, when Oedipus calls him to, you know, investigate this matter, uh, in initially, Tiresias does not reveal anything, but when Tiresias remains silent, uh, Oedipus becomes very angry uh, with him, you know, even disrespecting uh, that he is a blind old prophet. Uh, and then, you know, at that point, Tiresias grows tired of this continuous kind of harassment from Oedipus. And then he tells him, he openly tells him that uh, you know, you, ha you have killed your father and married your mother. Uh, but uh, initially, Oedipus does not, uh, you know, pay any heed to this. Okay, he in fact becomes even more angry with uh, Tiresias. And at that point, Creon in fact uh, interferes. And then uh, Oedipus uh, loses his temper with Creon too. But later, you know, later when Oedipus finally discovers uh, everything, uh, Creon continues because he was very loyal to him. He continues to be, um, you know, kind to him. So uh, these are the major characters there. And um, when you look at again, as I said about uh, tragedy and about um, uh, what do you say, uh, the fe the features, characteristic features of tragedy, you will find that uh, we spoke about the tragic flaw and. Uh, Oedipus is a tragic hero, okay, uh, with this uh, particular kind of flaw within him, this hamartia, this tragic flaw, uh, because he, uh, Aristotle uh, feels that, for one, uh, the hero in a tragedy should be uh, somebody who is way above the average man, and uh, Oedipus is this kind of a uh, you know, this kind of a person, uh, he is very smart and he is very clever. And there is a reference to, uh, you know, uh, the fact that he was in the land, the only person who could solve the riddle posed by a sphinx. Uh, so by his social standing as king and also uh, because of his intellect, uh, he is much above the average man. Uh, but you know, according to Aristotle, this um, this hero should also evoke pity and fear, you know, in the audience, and uh, that that is where the tragic flaw comes into the picture, where uh, you have a person who is imperfect, who may be great, okay, he is, uh, you know, much above an ordinary uh, man, okay, he is a hero. But at the same time, he is also uh, imperfect. So it's not that he is somebody, uh, what do you say, purely good, or at the same time, you know, completely bad. Okay, he is neither uh, completely white nor completely black. He has his own shades of gray, as they say. So he is a mixture that way. Okay, of both uh, uh, goodness as well as uh, you know, evil traits within him. And uh, those are something that uh, you can see also as the play goes. So he may be a clever man, uh, but he is not perfect. He is uh, uh, is not only initially blind to the truth, but he refuses to heed to all the warnings given by Tiresias. And Tiresias, in fact, um, as he becomes more and more frustrated by uh, Oedipus continuous kind of harassment. He even prophesies that he is a blind prophet. Okay, Teres is a blind prophet. He prophesies that Oedipus himself will become blind towards the end, and that also happens. 
it happens because oedipus himself uh, you know uh, he uh, kind of gorges out his eyes so he is a tragic hero who suffers because of this because of this uh, error in in judgment and all uh, then there is this aspect of uh, dramatic irony okay in this uh, thing it is a um, uh, figure of speech especially with regard to plays um, it is that you know the audience uh, as we watch this play uh, there are so many things that we know which the characters are unaware of so based on you know the knowledge that the audience uh, has um, they know the outcome of the story but um, as the hero or the protagonist oedipus he is not aware of it so his actions seem to be inappropriate with regard to what is going to come because through various kind of uh, what you say um, you know sequences within the play the audience we as the audience we um, get to know the fact much earlier in the play itself that oedipus in fact is the murderer of, of his father uh, but then you know he doesn't know it and that's why it is uh, you know uh, he he tries to change things based on what he knows and that is kind of ironic to the uh, audience they know the, uh, uh, the that you know um, the play is moving towards a big tragedy a tragedy that cannot be uh, avoided at any cost but the hero the protagonist does not know that and the way fate is uh, uh, portrayed and, and that is also kind of uh, linked to uh, you know dramatic irony uh, and that is important here because there are uh, it kind of shows that no matter what you do you cannot really uh, challenge fate or change your destiny uh so right in the beginning okay uh, you the the you know uh, oedipus parents jocasta and laius uh, they when they hear of this prophecy they make an attempt to get rid of oedipus the baby uh, it does not really happen so whatever has been prophesized whatever you know the oracles and the prophets they say uh, will happen it happens okay uh, jocasta tried to get rid of her baby but then uh, later on she finds that he is back and he has married her also okay and uh, oedipus also when you know he is brought up elsewhere and uh, when he gets to know that you know uh, this prophecy that he may kill his father and marry his mother he also lives leaves that place but then the people whom he is staying with are not his real parents so he leaves that place uh, and then he also uh, commits this murder he feels at that point of time that he has killed somebody entirely different but much later you know he finds that he has actually killed his father nobody else so uh, this portrayal the way you know fate is uh, depicted in this play is also very interesting and uh, uh, it is as i said related to uh, dramatic irony as you know uh, the every time the character or characters they try to um, kind of prevent the fate which has been prophesized by the oracles and the prophets uh, but as audience we know that their attempts are only futile it is not going to make any difference and that kind of um, uh, what you say emphasizes the sense of irony that is there you know uh, throughout the play so these are some of the main things that i want to share with you with regard to this you know uh, sophocles uh, oedipus rex in unit 1 the early part uh and probably the reason for including this in the syllabus is to you know um underline the way you know uh, tragedy uh, is uh, written 
okay as a as a play and also with regard to how uh, or what kind of an uh, a very strong influence it had greek tragedy had on uh, later uh, plays uh, that came in england mm. uh, so when you again go back to you know english drama and uh, you know the early traditions uh, you have the influence of greek drama no doubt about that uh, i spoke about uh, aristotle and also about this play oedipus rex by sophocles in addition to uh, you know that influence of greek drama uh, english drama also owes uh, a lot of its origins to uh, christianity Uh, and you know the customs and festivals related to the uh, church so based on that when you when you look at um, uh, the historical development of uh, drama in england uh, you have different kinds of uh, uh, plays uh, as they uh, evolved okay it's not that they all happened uh, what do you say simultaneously but Uh, as they evolved you have um, liturgical drama that is uh, uh, quite old as far as uh, english drama is concerned that is uh, they have been recorded as early as the 12th century ad and uh, they are all directly related to as i said the uh, you know uh, various happenings in the church and uh, initially they were uh, in latin because uh, the church service was also in latin at that point of time but uh, they did become popular and then they started uh, staging these kind of uh, plays in english also uh, generally they talk about the you know what do you say various stages of the life of christ uh, so you know the liturgical drama comes in that when then you have uh, epiphany place uh, you know where you talk about the early the birth of christ and uh, you know the coming of the wise men and uh, so on so that is another kind of play that uh, develop uh, you have passion plays also uh, which focus if ep- ep- epiphany plays focus more on the birth of christ uh passion plays they focus on the last days of christ on earth okay which uh, uh talk about his sufferings uh his crucifixion and uh, resurrection okay and they came much uh, later uh, also okay so this kind of uh, religious drama was quite uh, popular in england uh starting from 12 13 14 centuries and all uh different kinds of uh, you know religious religiously related uh plays were there uh much later you know a, another kind of play came so these were mostly this liturgical drama epiphany plays passion plays most of them were staged within the church okay but uh, later on with the advent of miracle plays uh drama kind of left the church and started getting staged outside first uh, you know initially in the churchyard they used to be staged but then you know uh, later on to a more uh, what to say public sphere you can say somewhere in the marketplace or where uh, people could uh, gather so once that started uh you know slowly uh, what do you say most of these earlier plays as i said when they were they were in latin but later on they started getting uh, staged uh, in uh, english and um, from the life of christ and other things related to um, what do you say christian festivals and all uh, miracle plays also started looking at uh, uh, christian religious history in england and uh, uh, slowly these kind of uh, you know developments happened and uh, as the play started moving the drama started moving out of the church earlier the people who you know acted were also 
uh, priests and friars and so on, people related to the church. But then, you know, as it moved out of the church, other people also uh, started coming in. Okay, people who <coughs> wrote the plays and uh, people who acted. Uh, all these kind of, uh, you know, developments started uh, happening. So miracle plays always had uh, some kind of a story from the Bible or something related to saints or somebody related to the, uh, what do you say, the, the history of Christianity in England and so on. Uh, and also you have, uh, you know, uh, morality plays. Morality plays also uh, started uh, getting staged. Uh, so these were also, you can say, uh, what, what, um, related to the earlier kind of place. But um, uh, now things or the subject matter need not or wasn't directly uh, taken from the Bible or the life of a saint and so on. Uh, but they were related. Okay, You had um, uh, the protagonist, the hero. Uh, was somebody who was a representative of mankind in general or you know they call it as every man okay so the hero is somebody who represents everybody and uh, then you have personifications okay you have um, for example purely negative personifications like death or uh, devil or demons and things like that being portrayed entirely negatively and you also had virtues the good things being personified in a positive way and uh, here uh, you also had uh, what you say this kind of uh, conflict between the forces of good and the forces of evil uh, mostly this conflict was in order to uh, what you say to acquire the soul of innocent people and uh, that that is something that uh, you know seeps into uh, the other play that uh, we have taken that is there you know uh, dr faustus so these kind of uh, things were very much there and in addition to that you also have something called as the interlude okay, interlude uh, uh, what do you say is a kind of a morality play with uh, dealt with uh, you know similar kind of things themes and uh, moral problems but um, mostly uh, there was a kind of overdose of comic elements and uh, sometimes it can be a short kind of uh, what do you say short play within uh, a larger play just to um, what do you say just to have certain comic elements or some kind of um, entertainment and uh, so on. So those things were also there. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, moving on, yeah, you have this, uh, you know, as theater started getting out of the church and uh, started expanding in Bates, uh, you have more uh, professional actors coming into the picture. You also have different kinds of theaters being formed, okay, as early as the uh, 16th century, late 16th century, you had different kinds of uh, theatres, Queen Elizabeth's Master of the Revels, Earl of Leicester's uh, stage, even uh, Shakespeare's own theatre, the Globe, which was built towards the back end of the 16th century. So more and more, uh, you know, these kind of uh, professional elements also started moving into uh, theatre. and. Uh, of course, uh, when you talk about uh, Elizabethan uh, drama, uh, the one figure that really uh, stands out there is William Shakespeare, and he stands out as far as the whole of uh, you know English drama is concerned. Uh, but there were other important people also, and uh, as his precursors, you had this uh, university wits. Okay, you had uh, other kind of secular playwrights coming and uh, uh, there was this group of uh, people uh, who had graduated at either Oxford or Cambridge and uh, they also started writing plays and uh, they made Elizabethan drama more literary and you can say more 
dramatic and they had you know then they exerted a lot of influence uh, on the theaters and also on later uh, playwrights like um, william shakespeare uh, to quickly look at them you know john lilly george peel robert green thomas lodge and thomas kidd these were the uh, university wits and uh, here briefly at least we need to look at uh, one play uh, by thomas kidd that came towards the end of that period the spanish tragedy and um, yeah, i say it's important because it is generally considered to be one of the earliest of the truly popular uh, tragedies as far as english uh, drama was concerned you have this revenge theme and uh, uh, other kinds of uh, important aspects related to the characters and uh, setting and so on uh, so these uh, playwrights these university wits also exerted uh, a lot of influence on later uh, dramatists okay so uh, you know who were able to uh, gain a lot uh, because of this and uh, it is generally considered that the uh, elizabethan age is uh, you know what you say considered to be one which was an age of glory as far as uh, english <coughs> drama uh, was concerned uh, yeah when you look at uh, tragedy and elizabethan uh, drama you you find that you know uh, they did a lot with regard to um, you know improving upon the greek influences and greek uh, practices they adhered to it yeah they followed the uh, guidelines set forth in poetics by aristotle and uh, a lot of time they also took uh, liberties with uh, you know the rigid kind of rules set forth by uh, this uh, you know aristotle and uh, you have this influence of uh, roman uh, philosopher called seneca and that is why this senecan uh, tragedy is also an important part of uh, you know or a kind of an influence on uh, earlier uh, british playwrights uh, senecan tragedy is also very much uh, what is a uh, based on uh, greek drama or uh, greek mythology Okay, so greek myths uh, they followed and uh, that kind of had an influence on the early uh, you know what do you say english uh, playwrights uh, to some extent it was there very much and uh, when you look at elizabethan uh, tragedy again you find this relation between man uh, and nature um, no nature need not be with regard to how we spoke about nature by talking about uh, the transcendentalists or you know thoro walden and so on but more also with regard to the the cosmic force man's position uh, in the universe and so on so uh, that was something that they did uh, you know talk about uh, in many of the works that uh, uh, they wrote and uh, yeah in the again as i said the influence of uh, greek tragedy uh, was very much there because you know uh, so many aspects of uh, greek tragedy you find in the works of uh, um, playwrights like shakespeare and also christopher marlowe uh, you know we talked about the um, aristotelian hero the tragic hero the the person the hero with a a tragic flaw okay something which uh, causes his own downfall though he is of noble birth he may be a prince or he may be a king or a warrior but because of that kind of a tragic flaw it leads to you know uh, his own downfall uh, then you also have this uh, element the, the chorus okay uh, person or people who function uh as chorus they you know they are mostly there in the introductory part and uh, towards the end also also sometimes uh, in between 
and uh, that's there in greek drama and to something that the uh, <clears throat> early you know elizabethan playwrights also uh, took it in their works uh, in addition to that the plot this dramatic irony all these kind of things you find in uh, you know elizabethan tragedy also uh, i wanted to look at uh, christopher marlowe and uh, dr foster's also but i think we are running a little short of time so maybe uh, this this part uh, and uh, you know the next unit or or within this unit we also have uh, william shakespeare Shakespeare's uh, two plays are given here, Midsummer Night's Dream and uh, just yeah, King Lear. So and and Christopher Marlowe is also there in that. So I think uh, maybe in the next class we can look at uh, that also along with uh, Christopher uh, Marlowe's works. Uh, you have anything to ask or anything of that kind with regard to? what i spoke about today i did make some inquiries about your uh, uh, exam and stuff you were all very anxious to know about that so yes sir i think um, there is a there is a circular also in the university website today uh, which Uh, says something. I, I, I mean, they have not given any specific dates. I think I didn't go through the circular, but if you visit our website, you can find the circular related to your exam. And I think, uh, yeah, it talks more about the mode of the exam, how the exam is going to be. Uh, but I think the exam will be there maybe um, third week or uh, last week, fourth week of uh, this month, and um, it may, you know. Continue till January. I don't know the ex the exact dates are not there. I think, but uh, most probably it will be there. You know, from the third week of December, third or fourth week of December, I think it will be there. So you can prepare yourself for that so that you know uh, you are ready whenever it uh, happens. Um, uh, do visit the university website. The circular is there. Circular talks about. uh the exam mostly uh with reference to how it is going to be conducted so i think that that's what uh, they are you know focusing on probably uh, if the dates are not given in that circular uh, i assume that this week itself the dates will be there your uh, this is uh, i understand this was your june uh, exam right june exam yes uh june exam which got postponed to uh, december so by 6 months uh, you are a little behind but anyway uh, in the circumstances uh, you know we can't really help these things so yeah so that's how it is and um, yeah, somebody i mean i did get a couple of emails asking for some materials and stuff sorry i couldn't send it i'll do that today uh but um generally as far as i know all these uh, materials and resources uh, even you know i understood that the uh western papers when i inquired i was told that these are all available uh in the DD. so you can you know, look at the website and can be downloaded from there okay, so it's not uh, very difficult so that can be done uh, the uh, the what do you say <clears throat> uh, resources that i have somebody had, had asked i will mail it to hmm? okay i think it is time for your next class also so we'll meet uh, tomorrow Okay, we will continue with this unit and try to finish it with the other place. So, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Oh, sir. Thank you, sir. Oh, yes, yes. Sir, I was done. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, and uh, kind of uh, like short answers and all. No, they can. How can we prepare it? And uh, 
uh, that we need to uh, start to prepare now so that the knowledge can be easy for us because uh, many of us are uh, uh, having a long distance gap. Uh, we had done our uh, BA many years back and then now yeah. we're doing it. Okay, okay. Uh, I don't know about the pattern, but um, I had said, um, as you said, some time back, that pattern only I uh, mentioned in one of the earlier classes. The two sections yes, yes, yes. and uh, uh, one has uh, short answers, uh, I think uh, five marks or something. And uh, okay. the other section, uh, essays, I think uh, maybe 15 marks. Okay, and in months. both the sections, uh, yeah, both the sections, uh, choices are there. Okay. So based, on, based on what you know best. No, what I asked. Right. So, uh, so, but again, so what to, I asked. you know, make things <laughs> for you. We are not the people who set the questions. So though we take uh, okay. this class, we don't set uh, paper. Some else usually does it. Hmm? Five marks oh, okay, and twelve marks. Uh, Five marks five marks and yes, sir. Out of eight, we what? have to attend five questions, sir. Okay. Okay, okay. Uh, that's great. Sir, uh, uh, there is another one is that we have uh, some few questions. I mean, uh, other questions are every uh, chapters with what we have, uh, you know, that uh, study materials. Uh, we study yeah, materials. Yeah. Every chapter, we have some few questions are there. So yeah. do we? I think uh, we need to follow with that or some something else. No, 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 no. <laughs> there will be other questions also. But uh, if you look at that questions, uh, I think they more or less cover uh, some of the important areas. Uh, okay. Uh, there will be other questions because uh, I don't think this these materials are available with whoever sets the papers because uh, they will just generally be given the syllabus. Uh, okay, based sir. on that, uh, you know, they'll be sitting. But if you go through that uh, questions, uh, they will they cover most of. I mean, some kind of a comprehensive outlook you will get. Okay, that means we'll not get fully. <laughs> uh, so we have be, to face. Mm, yeah, there may be uh, other questions also. Okay, okay. The pro possible questions so you may be knowing this as because you are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, possible questions only really kind of important things only we are covering here. Uh, okay, okay. Can be other things also. Because we have a very less time, <laughs> we don't have the time to go and prepare all things. I mean, uh, we don't think so. It's like a, a big ocean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, you had some more time now from June. So. You know, you can you now anyway. There is no time to read up all the primary texts. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Especially the uh, okay. Okay. Excuse me, Vinza. More... Hello. Uh, yes. Vinza, excuse me. Yes, yes. Go ahead. So actually, uh, I took admission from Mahi. Uh, uh, last year, 2019, I, I think. But right now, I am in Bangalore. Can I write uh, exams from uh, uh, Bangalore Center or what? No, no, that, um, th that's what you read that uh, circular which came today. I think they are talking about all these things. It's okay, more sir. Of, uh, writing. Uh, it's on the university website. Uh, from that, you can just check. Okay, sir. Thank you. Hmm? Okay, right. So, is there any information okay. about the uh, uh, exam fee and the uh, center what? and all? Uh, we have to write and all. No, is there any information about the uh, exam fee and? I don't because know. Nothing uh, is... Most of the things uh, they will be, you know, informing this week itself. I think in the today circular, some of the things are there. The other things will come uh, this week itself. They will tell you. Okay, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank okay. you. Okay. okay, I'll see you. Okay, okay thanks. Thank you. My God. They will hope. Devin, sir? Uh, uh, good yes. evening, students. Uh, uh, any queries regarding examinations, uh, kindly contact 0413-2654-436. You are requested not to ask any questions regarding examinations to the faculty. Okay. Kindly note it. Don't ask uh, any questions regarding examinations to the faculty. 
faculty you just call this number uh, 0413654436 uh now reshmi madam will take uh, uh, this hour uh, welcome madam ah oh, good evening good evening ma'am and good evening everybody hello can you all hear me am i audible yes ma'am yes ma'am okay okay Hello. Yeah. So, hello. Yeah. Some mic is on. Mic is on. I think. Please. Uh, yeah. Uh, see, I'll be taking modern, uh, that is British poetry for you. Uh, so I hope all of you have got the reading material for this. And uh, this has got uh, some five units. So in these classes, I have four classes with you. and uh, during this time i'll be trying to sum up the maximum i can and towards the end of the class if you have any doubts if you want me to explain list in the chat box also you can give your uh, queries or doubts okay yeah then <coughs> so poetry the first part of your uh, syllabus is uh, about poetry and as you all know you may all know about uh, uh, poetry and how is it different from prose so poetry should have some uh, kind of poetic language and the language of poetry is different from the language of prose then in po in poetry we give importance to subject sense theme and tone tone is important in poetry and uh, these are different uh, aspects of poetry then imagery imagery uh you may know what is an imagery that is image is the concrete representation of an idea or impression so when you hear the phrase gurgling water gurgling water you may get an image of that water's movement and then another usage times winged chariot hurrying near when you hear that uh we can uh, feel the representation of time in a very concrete manner so that is imagery so imagery is important in poetry it is the use of imagery metaphor simile etc meter rhyme etc that makes poetry different from prose and you may also know what is metaphor and simile and metaphor and simile i am not going to explain because that is very basic then diction diction means the lang the selection of words or vocabulary used by the poet in the poem then syntax syntax is the order of uh, words or the way words are organized in a poem the depth of a poem increases so how words are arranged in a poem that is syntax then prosody prosody is the arrangement of sound which means meter verse forms and other sound patterns okay then rhythm and meter so meter is of different types iambic trochaic spondaic anapaestic dactylic etc then so this is uh, about uh, this is an introduction to poetry and uh, sometimes you may get some short question from this uh, um, area and now we are straight moving to the shakespeare moving to the major writer shakespeare so there is an introduction to elizabethan age given here so elizabethan age refers to the time when queen elizabeth came to power in england elizabeth first became queen of england in 1558 when she was 25 years old and she reigned for about 45 years that period is called the elizabethan age in england and she 
gave a lot of support and encouragement to poets, dramatists, artists. Okay, and uh, then, uh, you know that uh, drama flourished during that time, Shakespeare being the greatest dramatist of that period. And uh, about Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare, uh, and you know him as a dramatist. Now, in this course, you are going to study him as a poet. And between 1592 and 1604, Shakespeare wrote four poems as well as creating a collection of sonnets. So Shakespeare wrote some long poems and also short poems sonnet. Some important works are Venus and Adonis, then Rape of Lucretia, then, uh, then we are coming to his sonnets. Now in your syllabus you have to study his sonnets. So what is his sonnet? You may all know that sonnet is a short poem of about uh, 14 lines and there are two types of sonnets in English. We have the Shakespearean sonnet and the uh, Milton, Milton sonnet written by John Milton. Different types of sonnet. Now we are going to the Shakespearean sonnet and the Shakespearean sonnet is arranged in uh, 14 lines in three quatrains, three quatrains and a couplet. The rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. That is uh, the sonnet, the 14 lines are divided into uh, three quatrains. Each quatrain has four lines and the rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F and the last couplet is G, G. This you have to remember because this is the difference uh, uh, between Shakespearean sonnets and the other types of sonnets. And you have to study Sonnet 29 and 30. And uh, Sonnet 29 is a poem that discusses the nature of love. So many of these sonnets are about love. And uh, generally, uh, the poets who wrote sonnets wrote about love. And Shakespeare, uh, actually, he wrote about love, duty, friendship, etc. And this particular sonnet, Sonnet 29, is about the nature of love. The poem discusses how when fortune leaves you, you may be in disgrace and alienated from everybody. You may also blame fate for the curse it has cast and you may desire to be like the one who has riches and friends. Then the human becomes least contented and keeps wishing for what others have. Just thinking of his beloved, he becomes like a lark and can arise at the break of day and sing hymns. So this poem is about the nature of love and uh, this sonnet shows us the poet feeling being unlucky and disgraced. And what causes, actually the poet is uh, uh, full of love but he is sometimes frustrated and unhappy. And uh, what causes his anguish we can only guess. But an examination of the circumstances surrounding his life at the time he wrote Sonnet 29 could help us to understand this depression. So during that time, uh, when he wrote this sonnet, London theatres were closed and uh, uh, the country suffered from plague. So he was in poverty and uh, difficult times and perhaps this caused uh, the pessimistic or the sad tone in this poem. Uh, Shakespeare was deeply disturbed by this assault and the feeling disgrace in men's eyes as well as fortunes. So that is about Sonnet 29. And uh, sometimes uh, whenever he is sad, he thinks about his beloved. Then next Sonnet, Sonnet 30 is about the goodwill of a friend. Uh, this is the next Sonnet. Of course, he has written a number of Sonnets and these two Sonnets you have to study. And Sonnet 30 is about the goodwill of a friend. When the poet thinks of the past, he feels the lack of many things that he could not get. He also feels the loss of friends, wealth, and maybe many things in life when one seeks in memory. Yet, when he thinks of the friend, then all losses are restored and the sorrows end as the dear friend means everything. 
In fact, uh, Shakespeare never mentions the name of the friend uh, in the sonnet or about whom he has written the poem, we do not know, but it is about uh, some friend. And uh, uh, we assume that this friend is a big person, a patron who helped Shakespeare to develop as a poet and uh, who even financially helped the poet. So this is a tribute to his friend and um, whom many people and the poet proclaims that the young man is the poet's redeemer and this theme continues in the above summit. So the poet also says that this uh, patron, his patron, his friend, his well-wisher uh, was his redeemer. The poet's sorrowful recollections of dead friends are sparked by the lover's absence and can be quelled only by thoughts of his lover, illustrating the poet's dependence on his dear friend for spiritual and emotional support. So we know that uh, the poet has a lot of love and respect and also dependence on this dear friend. And... Um, then uh, this uh, theme of uh, emotional dependence is also given here. So he, uh, this sonnet, the closing couplet of this sonnet reiterates lines 9 to 14 of sonnet 29 in a compact form, emphasizing that the patron is a necessity for quite emotional well-being. So you have to read sonnet 29 and also sonnet 30. Because uh, only then you will understand. If you read both these together, you will understand the meaning of this. One may be uh, read as a continuation of the other sonnet. Now, uh, actually, uh, with this uh, brief explanation, I have to go to the next uh, area, that is metaphysical poetry. And uh, you are supposed to read the sonnets in original. That you may get from uh, net. If you type uh, Shakespeare sonnets in Google, you will get or it, you will get from many anthologies and many books are there in the library regarding this or from Google also you will get uh, Shakespeare sonnet but you have to read it is better for you better to read it in original and then read the explanation now we have we have to move to metaphysical poetry what is metaphysical poetry and uh, metaphysical poetry is uh, this term was used by a group group of poets, 17th century poets. Some of these poets are Dunn, Marvel and Wogan. Though this was not a movement as such, they were studied together as a shared common features of wit, inventiveness and a love of elaborate style. So important metaphysical poets are Dunn, Marvel and Wogan. And uh, one common feature in their writing is they all had a lot of wit, inventiveness, a newness in style, and also a love of elaborate style. So the poetry of these poets explores the world by a rational discussion rather than by intuition or mysticism. So this is an important point. So uh, they have a very rational view of the world. So and. Uh, they don't give importance to intuition or mysticism like many other poets. They have a rational outlook and that is revealed in the type of imagery they use. That imagery which they use is called conceit, metaphysical conceit. The name metaphysical was first used by Dryden when in 1693 he criticized Dunn. He affects the metaphysics. Actually this word Metaphysical was first used by Dryden. You know, Dryden is a poet and also a critic. He he used it when he in an essay when he criticized John Donne. What did he say? He affects the metaphysics in his amorous verses, where nature only could reign, the per and perplexes the minds of the fair sex with nice speculations of philosophy, when he should engage their hearts. So this is a criticism on metaphysical poets by Dryden. Then, again, uh, in, uh, in one important essay titled The Metaphysical Poets, T.S. Eliot argued that their work fuses with reason and passion. 
It shows the unification of thought and feeling, which later came to be separated into a dissociation of sensibility. So what was T.S. Eliot's opinion about metaphysical poets? T.S. Eliot said that they combined reason and passion. Reason and passion. And there was also a unification of thought and feeling in their writing. And today, metaphysical poetry has gained a lot of... Actually, metaphysical poetry was again revived in the 20th century. Now we are coming to John Donne's poetry. John Donne's poetry. Uh, John Donne is uh, perhaps the most famous of these metaphysical poets. And I am not going to uh, tell about the personal life of John Donne because uh, that will waste our time. That you yourself can uh, read all that. And uh, John Donne, and about John Donne, he became a pioneer of what Dr. Johnson calls as metaphysical school. John Donne was a pioneer in the field of metaphysical poetry. The Good Morrow. The Good Morrow. Uh, this is a poem which expresses wonder as to what the speaker and his beloved did before they fall in love. So, he regards the former pleasures as childish and rustic and their former life as a long sleep in which they had no idea. And after marriage. So before marriage, it was a, a kind of childish love. And uh, he compares himself and his beloved to seven sleepers who slept for 200 years in their den. And the speaker feels that the other lovers that he loved and which he could get now seem to be mere visions or reflection of the beauty of the present one. So love, uh, only his wife, or the love with his wife is the only true love. Love before marriage and the other love of his he had seemed to be meaningless uh, now for him. And then... Love now reigns supreme and they do not want to see any new signs or sickness. He feels that he and his lover are two new worlds and the two lovers' worlds are fused and blended together into a single unity. And here, uh, he is, uh, so he is telling or he is idolizing uh, marital love and love to his wife and uh, now he is using some imagery here. He says that the face of the lover is reflected in the eyes of the beloved and that of the beloved in his own eyes. Their, their faces reflect each other and also display the simplicity and honesty in their heart. So their faces reflect each other and see here the imagery comes. Their two faces are like hemispheres and together they make up a complete world. Their two faces are like two hemispheres. And put together, they become a complete world. That is again, a complete world in the sense, uh, it is not just in appearance. At that time only, it will be meaningful. In a way, the two hemispheres are better than the geographical hemispheres. And these two hemispheres, he says, are better than the geographical hemispheres. Because in the geographical hemisphere, you may have uh, some kind of uh, elevation or depression, etc. But here, uh, they are well united, well united in love. And their love would be immortal if they love each other equally and may never disappear forever. So this is a celebration of love. And uh, this imagery, which the metaphysical poets use, is called metaphysical conceit. So here, John Donne has used a conceit uh, that is comparing the faces of lovers to two hemispheres. Now we are coming to the Cavalier poets and uh, the Cavalier poets use intellectual conceits of the metaphysical poets such as Dunn and also that of the elegance of poets like Ben Johnson. So they used the conceits, the intellectual conceits of metaphysical poets like Dunn and also the beauty of the poets like Ben Johnson. And uh, uh, then they use direct and colloquial language expressive of a highly individual personality as well as the casual and amateur style. Some important poets are Thomas Carew, 
John Suckling, Richard Lovelace, Aurelian Township, William Scott Wright. And uh, uh, these poets are called uh, the uh, Cavalier Poets and uh, they belong to the lyrical tradition. They wrote in a lyrical way. Uh, lyrical is in a musical way. And um, uh, by their words, they depicted the fact that poetry too could celebrate the minor pleasures and sadnesses of life. And uh, so they depicted very simple things, simple aspects of human life through their poetry. Then, now we are coming to Andrew Marvel. Marvel, that is full name is Andrew Marvel. And uh, yeah, like um, his important poem is To His Coy Mistress. This is a very famous poem. Um, it is prescribed in every institution. So Marvel's poem, To His Coy Mistress, discusses the theme of love. So this is about his, actually this poem is about his uh, beloved. It is addressed to his beloved. He wishes his love to be tranquil and drawn out. And the poem begins like this. Had we but world enough and time, this coyness lady were no crime. So now uh, Marvel, uh, Andrew Marvel, the poet, in this poem is telling about the, the rapid passage of time. Time moves very fast. We all approach our end very soon. We may die soon. So there is no time to waste. There is no time to waste talking meaningless things. So his uh, beloved is very coy and he says that uh, the precious time we, we have to, we have before us, we have to utilize in love. Then, he says he refers that if they had time while well, he would be walking on the tide of humber, his very love would be walking beside Ganges. He then alludes to religious scripture, giving the impression of vast ages passing, spanning most of time itself. I would love you ten years before the flood, and you should, if you please, refuse till the conversion of the Jews. So, uh, what he says is. Uh, uh, see, uh, he uh, that is there is no time to waste in life and make use of the time to the best. And he also mentions that uh, the narrator or the speaker's love is like a slow growing vegetable, but the later part implies that love would engulf empires at the same time it would not race against time. And he also uh, celebrates the beauty of his beloved in this poem. And uh, he says that time's winged chariot is racing. Time's winged chariot, that usage has come from Andrew Marvel's poem, this particular poem. And Marvel says, time's winged chariot is racing and the future is filled with vast spaces of eternity. And... Uh, uh, he says that physical beauty that he had praised a few lines earlier would no longer be there and the grave would become a fine and private place. Since time is flying and days are rolling, it is best to make up the moment and hence he says, let us spot while we may. So this is the main theme of the poem. Let us spot, let us enjoy while we may live. This is the main theme of the poem. Then, so here, uh, so death is coming, so we should love, we should utilize the time. Uh, that is the main idea of this poem. And uh, then, next, we are going to the age of Milton. And uh, you may know about the great uh, grand poet Milton. So Milton was the epic poet who wrote uh, Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained. So Milton is a very great name in literature and uh, um, Milton's pastoral poetry is going to be discussed here. Actually about Milton I will just uh, say a few things. Um, like uh, he, he, he was very, uh, he, he had a lot of love towards music and literature and uh, uh, he wrote uh, uh, this Il Penseroso and La Allegro. And also the mask. Mask is a type of uh, uh, work. Comus. Uh, Il Penseroso, La Allegro and Comus came out. That was published. And then, um, see, 
Then he wrote, in 1660, he lost his position as Charles II was restored to the throne. And uh, during the last years of his life, he wrote the greatest work, Paradise Lost, Paradise Regained, Samson Agonist, that is Samson in Agony. And uh, these are his epics. Then Milton also wrote other forms of poetry named sonnets, pastoral elegies, and pamphlets. See, Milton was blind. That also you should remember. With all that uh, physical problem, uh, physical discomfort, he wrote so much. And uh, uh, the pastoral, as pastoral poem, we have to study uh, Lysidas here. And uh, uh, this particular poem, uh, Lysidas, uh, this is actually it's a long poem. And uh, this is written for a dead friend who dies when his ship sank. And the poem first appeared in 1638 in a collection of elegies. And uh, this collection is, uh, or this is about the death of Edward King, a college mate of Milton's at Cambridge, who drowned when his ship sank off the coast of Wales in 1637. So Elizabeth is a pastoral elegy. Uh, you all know, I think, what is an elegy? So elegy is a poem which is lamenting the death of somebody uh, dear to the poet. So here it is about Edward King, Milton's college mate at Cambridge University. And uh, the sudden and untimely death of Edward King, uh, uh, like uh, made, uh, in inspired Milton to write this poem, write this elegy. There are 12 sections and each of the three major sections begins with invocation. Then it explores the form and concludes with poets on emotional. And then, uh, that is about uh, Lycidas. Actually, it is a beautiful elegy. It is a considered to be a pastoral elegy. Uh, pastoral elegy means um, it is an elegy which uses pastoral conventions. And this genre, uh, that is pastoral elegy, this genre was initiated by Theocritus, the ancient writer Theocritus, and also put to use by Virgil and Spencer. Theocritus, Virgil, Spencer, all of them wrote pastoral elegies, and Lysidas is a pastoral elegy in that tradition. Uh, here, uh, the dead friend, uh, the mourners are all presented as shepherds, and the setting is given a pastoral imagery. That is the importance of pastoral uh, elegy. That is, um, their characters are presented as shepherds and the setting is pastoral. Now, we are coming to Augustan age. <coughs> Augustan age, that is 18th century, is uh, called as the Augustan age. And 18th century poetry is called the Augustan poetry. Then, poetry of this age is not only intellectual, but also has an eye for style and form. Uh, what is the special feature of Augustan poetry? It has a, an uh, important style and form. And the dominant style of the 18th century was neoclassicism. Neoclassicism, order, balance, harmony characterize this time. So neoclassical poetry had order, balance, and harmony. Then, so this means uh, they gave a great importance to the mechanics of poetry. And at its best, the neoclassic idea sought to mediate between nature and art, imagination and reason, delight and instruction. So neoclassical art, neoclassical idea sought to mediate between nature and art, imagination and reason, delight and instruction. So poetry should, you know, uh, when a, from very ancient times there were debates regarding the purpose of poetry. Some poets and critics said that poetry should delight us. Some people said it should be full of passion. Some people said poetry should instruct us. Neoclassical poetry gave both delight and instruction. It appealed to our heart as well as to our mind. Then, so, and, and, and during the neoclassical period, mock heroic type of poetry, or elegy, epistle, verse, tale, ballad, epigram, prologue, everything flourished. Then, 
And uh, during this time, uh, a kind of grandiose and abstract themes were used and uh, poetry became more concerned with the general in order to elevate ideas it was trying to convey. And many of the uh, people who read the poetry were members from aristocracy and upper middle class during that time. But one must remember that the poets at the time were educated men. Therefore, when they wrote, they wrote for those who would understand their message. Actually, neoclassical poetry was very ornate, very ornate or very decorative type of poetry. And it was not easy for the common man or the ordinary people to understand it. And now we are coming to John Dryden, a great uh, poet of this age. So Dryden, he was born in 1631. And uh, just now, actually a little, uh, some time back, we uh, read of Dryden's comment about um, another poet, that is a metaphysical poet. That same Dryden we are going to study now. And uh, Dryden, uh, he, he wrote... Uh, and um, I'll just uh, mention uh, some of his works. Max Flacconau. Max Flacconau, that is an important work, a satire. Then Annus Mirabilis, uh, that is another work of uh, Dryden. And then uh, Apology for Heroic Poetry and Heroic License. Uh, this article defends the heights of expression demanded by the epic form and mentions Milton specifically as a descendant of Homer and Virgil. So this is an essay, Apology for Heroic Poetry and Heroic License, an essay written by Dryden, in which he mentions that Milton is a direct descendant of Homer and Virgil. That means Milton is carrying the tradition of the ancient epic poets Homer and Virgil. So Dryden was a critic very big critic, very famous critic, and also a poet. Then another work, The Preface to Fables, Ancient and Modern. This is another important critical work of uh, Dryden. And this contains one of the most extended praises of Chaucer in early literature, after Spencer's Invocation of Fairy Queen. You may be studying uh, some of these articles in your criticism paper. Then, Max Flacknow. We are going to deal with Max Flacknow now. Max Flacknow is a mock heroic satire written after King Charles II had come to power. So the poem is satirical and criticizes an individual not for his character but for his aspiration. So it uh, satirizes. You know what is a satire? Satire is actually like making fun of something, somebody. And satire is not a very poisonous type of poetry. It's not a kind of, it is not meant to destroy an individual. Satire is to make fun of that person and to help him to get rid of his weaknesses or follies. And uh, here, uh, this, uh, this is satirizing the aspirations of an individual. And at a larger level, poem is more universal, questioning the way society works. And uh, this poem is a direct attack on Thomas Shadwell. So in this poem, uh, Dryden uh, satirizes another poet named Thomas Shadwell. Because there were a lot of disagreements between Thomas Shadwell and Dryden. And uh, Shadwell considered himself as heir to Ben Johnson. And variety of comedy is the latter had commonly written. Shadwell was a comic uh, writer of comedy. And Shadwell, uh, that is, declared that he is to say, to Ben Johnson. He is like Ben Johnson. Hmm? And Shadwell's, actually, Shadwell's poetry was not of uh, the same standard as Johnson's. And it is possible that Dryden, uh, wearied of Shadwell's argument, actually what happened was, Shadwell was an inferior poet of that day, but he pretended that he was really great. And perhaps Shadwell also ridiculed Dryden for his type of poetry. And uh, um, not, only, uh, not only this, both of them were separated due to some political rivalry also. Uh, because both of them belong to two different political groups. So this kind of uh, resentment between both resulted in this particular poetry titled Max Flacknow. Then... And in this poem, 
Uh, Dryden illustrates Shackwell as the heir to a kingdom of poetic dullness, represented by his association with Richard Flecknoe, an earlier poet Dryden disliked, but Dryden does not use belittling techniques to satirize him. That is, Dryden says that Shag Shagwell is heir to a kingdom of poetic dullness, and Shagwell can be linked not to Johnson, but to Richard Flecknoe, that is another inferior poet of the time. Then, uh, actually, how Dryden satirizes Shadwell is, he elevates Shadwell to a position of greatness and obvious disparity between the Shadwell in the poem and the one in reality serves to make his point. Actually, it's a, a very interesting satire. Uh, Max Flecknow, if you read that, you'll, uh, you'll actually laugh like anything. It will be very interesting. But the language is a bit tough. You have to understand the meaning of each line and uh, read it and enjoy it. And this is written in mock heroic style. Mock heroic style means it is written like an epic. It uses the epic conventions and is uh, written like an epic, but it is a mock heroic epic. It is just a satire, not a real epic. Then, now we are coming to Pope or Alexander Pope, a very famous poet. You might uh, remember one of his important uh, quotations. That is, uh, little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or taste not the Peorian spray. That is a quotation from Alexander Pope, which I always uh, uh, keep in mind. Little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or taste not the Peorian spray. So, Alexander Pope, Alexander Pope, uh, uh, his famous work is The Rape of the Lock. That is a mock epic poem. Uh, then just see, during this time of uh, neoclassical age or Augustan age, uh, so many uh, mock epics, uh, satires came up. Mm? And Rape of the Lock was published in 1712. Uh, you remember, uh, that is, you should understand that Pop was just 23 years old at that time. So just imagine how much scholarship he had to write such a poem at that tender age. And this poem helped to establish poet's reputation as a poet and remains his most frequently studied work. This is a very uh, popular work. Actually, this is uh, based on a real life incident. And um, this incident is that, um, uh, that is Robert, uh, Lord Peter cut off a lock of Arabella Farmer's hair and the young people's family fell into strife as a result. Actually, uh, this is about the strife or the quarrel between two families. And this happens because uh, one young fellow from one uh, family, he cut the lock of a beautiful lady. Lock means the dresses of hair or further of a lady in the other family. And uh, this created a fight, a kind of war between the family. That is the theme. Uh, actually, that is why it is titled the rape of the lock. Then, and um, here, uh, the, that, that is, we are coming to the poem now. Actually, it is based on a real incident. And uh, now we are coming to the poem, uh, Belinda, based on the historical Arabella former. Actually, the real Historical characters were Arabella Farmer and another man. But in this poem, uh, the female character is, or the central character is named Belinda. So Belinda arises to prepare for the day social act. Yes. Belinda uh, prepares for the day social activities after sleeping late. So Belinda, when she is... Um, uh, she gets a uh, kind of uh, warning uh, by her guardian sylph, by her guardian angel, that something uh, tragic is going to fall upon her. But Belinda give, doesn't give much importance to this. And after an elaborate ritual of dressing and primping, she travels on the river Tha on the Thames, river Thames, to Hampton Court Palace, an ancient royal residence outside of London, where a group of wealthy young socialites are gathered for a party. Actually, this is a mock epic poem because a kind of grandeur is given to characters, to the events, etc. But the action actually is a very simple or very silly action. But a very majestic style 
majestic words are used that is why it is called a mock um, heroic poem and then many people have assembled in that party and among them is the baron who has already made up his mind to steal a lock of belinda's hair then uh, he um, also actually he is well prepared to cut a part of uh, belinda's lock golden locks and uh, then um, what happens is uh, then uh, when everybody is in a happy mood baron takes up a pair of scissors and manages to cut off the coveted lock of belinda's hair and belinda is furious and she becomes belinda becomes very angry and her friend uh, tries to cleanse up who has aided the baron in his crime urges belinda to give up her anger in favor of good humor and good sense moral qualities which will outlast her vanity actually clarissa has helped the baron to cut this lock of hair but she now advises belinda to forget this and take it in a humorous way but clarissa's moralizing is not uh, uh, taken into account by belinda and she gets angry and a scuffle develops between the ladies and gentlemen between the two families and uh, then belinda says she wants that golden lock back her her hair uh, the tuft of hair back and the lock is lost in the confusion of this mock battle however the poet consoles the bereft belinda with the suggestion that it has been taken up into the heaven and immortalized as a constellation so the poet just says that uh, no uh, he, the belinda is consoled saying that her golden locks are not lost it has become it has gone to the heaven and become a constellation a group of stars in the sky so this is the type of uh, grand style which is uh, given to the small incident or small action so that is why it is a more heroic poem and uh, this also helps us to understand the poem helps us to understand the vanities and idleness of the 18th century high society that is the way this people from this high society lived how they spent time on meaningless activities on luxurious activities etc then the poem is the best example in english language of the genre of mock epic so this is a mock epic poem and this is a very good example for that a very representative example of that then the strategy of pop's mock epic is not to mock the form itself but to mock his society in its very failure to rise to epic standards exposing its pettiness by casting it against the grandeur of the traditional epic subjects and the bravery and fortitude of epic heroes this is the very important sentence that is pop is not satirizing the form of the epic poetry through this pop we should clearly understand alexander pop is not uh, making fun of the form of the epic but what is what he is criticizing is the failure of his society to rise to epic standards he is exposing the pettiness the silliness of his society by giving it by casting it in a very uh, in a very grand style and uh, that is he is just exposing to us the silliness of his society and his mock heroic treatment in the rape of the law underscores the ridiculousness of a society in which values have lost all proportion and the trivial is handled with the gravity and solemnity that ought to be accorded to truly important issues so it is like see giving undue importance to a trivial thing that is what is done in mock epic by doing this alexander pope is not making fun of the epic style but he is showing us the frivolous nature the silly nature of his own society society in upper class people of his society they will give undue importance to very small issues because they have nothing else to do then the poem mock reveals the unworthiness of men by adopting the heroic form the mock epic resembles the epic in that its central concerns are serious and often moral but the fact that the approach now be satirical rather than earnest is symptomatic of how far the culture has given 
so when the great epic poets like uh, homer's uh, uh, homer virgil etc or even ramayana mahabharata etc in the in indian tradition was written those times the heroes were worthy people were worthy they had some principles but when you use the conventions of that poetry to the present day we can only make fun of the society because our present day people don't deserve that kind of grand style because we are just uh, ordinary or uh, frivolous people then so this is a very important poem and uh, you have to uh, read this and understand it in detail then cosmetic clothing jewelry are the replacements for armor and weapons while the rituals of religious sacrifice are located in the dressing room so in the ancient epic poetry people do puja they do religious rituals they do sacrifices before they start the war but here uh, that is not there instead of arms and weapons only cosmetic jewelry are used and the uh, dressing room is the center of religious sacrifice like dressing room in the sense uh, the elaborate ritual of dressing up is mentioned in the poem so uh, that is how he has uh, made it a more epic poem the worst form of the rape of the lock is the heroic couplet so heroic couplet is the worst form of the poem okay so now uh, we are uh, from agastyan age uh, that is the that uh, forms the first unit of your uh, syllabus now uh, a little more i'll take today that is uh, we just uh, go to an introduction uh, to the next age that is uh, that is romantic age because we have five units to cover and i have only four classes so i have to cover a little more in today's class so here uh, the romantic age we are coming to the second unit the romantic age when you come to the romantic age i hope uh, that is very uh, this uh, i hope that uh, this uh, unit will be easy for you because uh, you all know about uh, romanticism or romantic age because every literature student knows about shakespeare uh, coleridge byron keats etc so romantic age is a very important age in uh, liter literary history and uh, the background of the romantic age is the french revolution and why is the french revolution important for us because the french during the Re french revolution they advocated liberty equality and fraternity you know the meaning of liberty free, uh, freedom equality you know the meaning and fraternity is brotherhood sense of brotherhood so these were the main uh, uh, tenets of french revolution and uh, this french revolution also helped to spread a, a kind of democratic spirit in england in europe during this time then so french revolution is important then we are coming to the age of sensibility and what is the age of sensibility uh, that is uh, sensibility became an object of intense interest in the late 18th century as the issues on which it focuses the social relationships among individuals become more fluid the discourse of sensibility begins to take center stage in english literature as a stability of the class structure it theorizes could no longer be taken for granted then um, so these are uh, just uh, some uh, like some terms in that uh, liter literary period but anyway you uh, don't have to give much importance to these terms romanticism or romantic movement romantic period you study when that is the most important in this uh, uh, unit and here uh, the english romantic poets traditionally studied as the big six so who are the romantic poets in english william blake william wordsworth samuel taylor coleridge p b shelley byron and john keats these authors claim re repeatedly that they are doing something radically new to save poetry from the outworn traditions of the 18th century see uh, just now you studied now we started with the elizabethan age today right elizabethan age you know the age of shakespeare actually shakespeare was not the only poet during that time 
we had another important poet i'm just summing up now i'm just uh, uh, making you record what we studied now so shakespeare was not the only important poet during the elizabethan time you had spenser also who wrote the famous work fairy queen so their poems reflected the tradition of that particular age then after that you had the age of milton then the new classical writers new classical writers wrote in a bit. of course in between you had the metaphysical poets then new classical poets new classical poets used uh, very ornate and decorative style in their poetry it was also the time when uh, satires and mock epics flourished in literature now we are coming to the romantic period in english and this romanticism started with the publication of lyrical ballads in english and that was published in 1798 so this is considered to be the starting date of english romanticism so lyrical ballads was published by wordsworth and coleridge together in 1798 okay so this uh, actually what is the uh, nature of romantic poetry how is it different from the poetry of the previous age the romantic poets they are fed up with the a kind of gaudy and inane phraseology of the previous century writers this is a phrase gaudy and inane phraseology that is meaningless and decorative the romantic poets considered the previous century poets as uh, uh, very meaningless poets who used very decorative style in their poetry and they wanted the romantic poets wanted to bring poetry down to the level of the common people because neo classical poetry could be read and enjoyed and appreciated only by educated people only by elites because it was that much stuff and romantic poets said no why should you write poetry like that poetry should be enjoyed by everybody only then you can bring in some social change so you have to change the diction of poetry you have to change the style of poetry uh, with that view they started this romantic movement okay so uh, romantic movement i'll just uh, tell you what are the important features of romantic movement one important quality you may all say is uh, the return to nature they all wrote poems about nature about uh, landscape about nature about uh, small small uh, things in life and also about simple and ordinary people farmers rustics working class people etc because um, nature is the most important theme in romantic poetry because nature for wordsworth nature is like a teacher then about simple aspects of life and simple and rural and rustic people because wordsworth and coleridge they believed that they are the most uh, truthful people or they are people who are closest to nature only they can understand the wisdom from nature and then another important quality of romantic poetry is it is written in a lyrical style lyricism or musical quality is one important feature of romantic poetry then another important feature is simplicity in language and diction it is written in simple language as wordsworth stated it is written in language of man speaking to men what did wordsworth say poetry should be written in language of man speaking to men just like our ordinary conversation it should be so simple that's what uh, wordsworth believed and then uh, like uh, poetry should be in the language of man speaking to men and uh, also these poems are very emotional or subjective again you can recall the wordsworth definition of poetry poetry is a spontaneous overflow of powerful feeling later he also stated that it is emotion recollected in tranquility so all these definitions are very true about the type of poetry he wrote okay actually wordsworth was not alone in his uh, poetic theory he was with coleridge together they published the lyrical ballads a collection of poetry uh, which started the romantic movement in english literature actually romantic movement is a very important movement because from the uh, very high level of 19th century poetry that is from 19th century poets wrote in a very grand style and ordinary people could not understand from that level 
Wordsworth and Coleridge brought poetry down to the ground, to the level of the common man, to the ordinary people. That also shows their sense of democracy, democratic spirit. Because you see, democratic spirit means uh, everybody, every individual should be given importance, not just only the elite. Ordinary people should also be given importance. That is democracy. Right. Any ordinary individual is important in a democratic setup. So poetry is brought to the level of common man. And again, French Revolution inspired them to write this type of poetry because the ideas of liberty, equality, and fraternity influenced romantic poets. So I have just uh, summed up uh, the importance of uh, very important aspects of uh, uh, romantic movement. And uh, now you can read this. Read this. Uh, you are not sad, you will find these points are here. Okay. And uh, yeah. Now if you have any uh, clarifications, you can ask. Actually, the important romantic poets, I'll say once again, are it starts with William Blake, Wordsworth, Coleridge, Shelley, Byron, and Keats. And uh, John Keats. And uh, some important points from, yeah, 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 yes? Ma'am, um, I think it is too fast. Pardon? It is too fast. Fast? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, things, uh, the, the points are not able to, I mean, like, you are catching up, you are catching up your words, um, but uh, uh, some uh, explanations are going up so fast. Okay. Uh, I'll make it so. What is the part? What is the part? I should, I'll tell it again. Which part I should say again? Uh, I think this, uh, it's already over the second part. I'm making the first unit. Pardon? The first unit. The first unit, the first unit. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, the problem is, see, I know uh, I was a bit fast, but see, uh, the problem is uh, I was also in an anxiety because we have only four hours and so many units are there. So how to cover in okay. that uh, time, I do not know, actually, because a lot of things are here. It is very difficult to be covered within the time. So that, uh, maybe, okay. that feeling made me a bit fast, I think. Uh, right. Anyway, I think it is recorded, and they may also give you uh, this. Uh, yeah. It's okay. Now, now you, you have. Okay. okay. Uh, but I may in the next class I'll make it very slow. I don't have problems. See, I can go slow also, but I may not be able to cover much then. But I'll go slow. Okay. I have no problem. I can speak slowly. Okay. Uh, we, that is the only thing. Uh, so first unit you didn't get it. Eh? First unit, Sebastian. First unit. Oh okay, okay, man, okay, man. That is great. And uh, Anna. Yeah. Next class I'll be slow. Okay, don't worry. I'll slow. Oh. Explain slowly. Then. Yes, yes. And uh, why no? No. Man, can we do one 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 more thing? Can we do one more thing? That, uh, yeah, yeah, you ask. You ask. Man, uh, can we one? Okay, I got it, but uh, now when we have finished off the, the end of you can end, end of the part, I mean, end, end part. Write in the chat box. Uh, a little. End part. Romantic moment, yeah? Romanticism. Or first unit. Please write in the chat box because your voice is not very audible. Thank you. What should I? Which which part you didn't get first? First unit or this? What I just I said just now. Which Thank part? you, ma'am. But 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 why do you explain? Uh, could you please uh, tell us which are the important points and uh, the questions that will come in the examination for the exam oriented. Yeah, actually, the exam oriented. Uh, the questions are given in your notes. If you take this. Study materials, you just see if you take the study materials. Maybe it's because of a net network problem here, that's why. Right. Uh, I know when you, when you explain, ma'am, when you explain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, ma'am, when you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When you. No, no, no. The other one, also, when you explain, ma'am, can you hear me? 
the first unit or second unit also when you explain or could you yeah you write i don't no, no, not the romanticism but the other one the first unit are able to hear you the first unit first unit okay i say first unit. yeah i just uh, take the first unit now see uh, actually uh, all see all the questions what can you read and not uh, if you take the study materials for you
and uh, his uh, Lycidas, this particular poem. That's all. And coming to Augustine age, uh, you have to uh, study John Dryden, the important features of Dryden's poetry, and also this poem, Max Flecknoe. Max Flecknoe is here. Then Alexander Pope's Rape of the Law. Actually, your syllabus is quite vast. I don't deny it. It is quite vast. Uh, but at least a summary of that you study. And uh, these works you have to uh, study. So how is uh, uh, neoclassical poetry different from the poetry of the previous age? Uh, and how is, so only if you understand that, you will know how is romantic poetry different from the neoclassical poetry, etc. So uh, because uh, you said I am fast, in the next class I will also explain romantic poetry once again. I don't have any problem. But the uh, only thing is, uh, I don't know how much we can cover within this contact class period. That's my fear. But anyway, I'll go slowly and uh, I can do that. No problem. Okay. And I think this is recorded also. So uh, you can hear it again, I think. You may have the facility to hear it again and uh, listen to that again later if you want. Then anything else? Of course, uh, you have to work hard because your syllabus is vast and you also try to um, uh, actually, if you study only important questions, I don't think it will help you because we don't know from where questions will be coming. But you understand everything, at least a summary of everything you get. Then you can manage for the exam. Anything else? Anything else? No, um, thank you, ma'am. Okay. Uh, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Next class, I'll sum up the main features of uh, romantic period again. Don't worry. I'll start that again and then uh, take class. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, okay. Bye. Good night. Good night. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, okay.